So you're competitive. Obviously, we raced against each other. You're ultra competitive. And you get supersonic pissed off when you when, when things don't go Danica's way. That's I like that the most about you. Because I like getting pissed off when things don't go my way. When was the time that you feel like you let it out the most and paid the biggest consequence? You know, probably the only time that I ever really let myself go that I didn't, like, I didn't care. Like, I was so pissed off, I didn't even know my helmet was on. Put it that way. With Ryan Newman, after the race, because honestly, it scared the crap out of me. After the race, it's over, and I'm taking my belts off. Like, I didn't even have seat belts on and he hit me and it spun me head on into the wall i mean i wasn't going 180 mile an hour anymore but i was still running probably 70 i lost it next thing i know um some crew guy has a hold of me and, and it's got me clear off my feet and i was like rock him sock him to ryan newman through through his window net like i didn't even know what was going on i was so mad but it was you know that's that's racing that's competition right This podcast exists because I love talking to people and I love going deep. The purpose is to plant seeds of inspiration. We enter a space of vulnerability and relatability. And what you realize is that we are so much more alike than we are different. To quote Ram Dass, we're all just walking each other home. And the show is just one step. I'm Danica Patrick and I'm pretty intense. On the show today is my very good friend, Clint Boyer. Uh, He's a retired NASCAR driver and we were teammates at the end. And God, we just had like, okay, so if you don't know who Clint is, you're going to want to get to know Clint. Let's just start off by saying he's like BFFs with Blake Shelton. So that's the kind of guy that Clint is. He's awesome. He's funny. He likes to drink. You know, he's, he's, he's a lot of fun, um, but he also has a lot of passion and he accomplished so much in racing and now he's commentating. But we just, you know, we talked about NASCAR. We talked about what racing's really like. He told so many funny stories and we talked about just, you know, the future of the sport, but in a really holistic way, like things that could apply to any job and any business, any entertainment entertainment sort of uh, company. It just was really, it was a really cool conversation. And Clint is just hilarious all along the way. And this is one of those that he, he could be a comedian basically, but instead he drove race cars and I'm grateful because he's my friend now. And yeah, we just had a really good time. So please enjoy this interview with my friend, Clint Boyer. I have, I have a new motto mantra for myself, but the old one was try harder, which is essentially, I'd say, try harder, do better. Um, now my saying is, oh, well, (laughs) I like that one. Yeah. Well, oh, well, (laughs) something happens. I'm like, oh, well. It's su- it might be the most helpful one I've ever had because I don't really have a problem trying harder. I have a problem letting things go. So, oh, well, helps me let things go. So you're competitive. Well, obviously, we've raced against each other. You're ultra competitive. I'm ultra competitive. And you get supersonic pissed off when, you, when, when things don't go Danica's way. That's I like that the most about you because I like getting pissed off when things don't go my way. It feels better. It, yeah, it's it's an expression of what's cooped up inside. That's Sometimes right. You just got to let it out. When was the time that you feel like you let it out the most and paid the biggest consequence? You know, probably the only time that I ever really let myself go that I didn't like I didn't care. Like I was so pissed off. I didn't even know my helmet was on. Put it that way. And with Ryan Newman after the race, because honestly, it scared the crap out of me. We got together on a racetrack and things happen, right? Well, what, what track? At Charlotte. Mm-hmm. And I am literally after the race, it's over and I'm I'm taking my belts off. Like I didn't even have seat belts on and he hit me and it spun me head on into the wall. I mean, I wasn't going 180 mile an hour anymore, but I was still running probably 70 you know, and, and smoked the wall and spun back around. And I was it like, literally didn't even have my, my anything on, dude, I lost it. I, I went completely out of my mind. And, and last next thing I know, I'm, I'm literally some, some crew guy has a hold of me and, and it's got me clear off my feet. And I was like, rock him, sock him to Ryan Newman through, through his window net. Like, I didn't even know what was going on. I was so mad, but it was, you know, that's, that's racing. That's competition, right? 
That's the it. moment, though. You ask the question. That's oh, the yeah. one that got away from me. What was the one? Because I love a good fight and I love I love it. And when like when there's a red flag and you're still on track and there's a fight that breaks out, you know, because the crowd gets excited. And the one I'm thinking of that has an awesome clip that's turned into a total like meme gift for you is I think it was Phoenix. Well, I know it was Phoenix and you running through the from the from pit lane through the garage. Were you chasing Jeff down? Jeff Gordon. Yeah, my counterpart. Yeah, and now you work together. What yeah, the hell? Yeah, yeah. yeah that's, that, that's, what, uh, that, what happened? Well, the first day back on the job was a little bit awkward. Let's just go <laughs> ahead and say that. <laughs> we had to get past our differences, which there was a lot of differences right there. But at, at the end of the day, we both knew that that was going to be fine. But that was... The end what of did the, he do to you? He wrecked me. Now, I, I, he calls it retaliation. I call it, it was it was that aggravation and... and you know, he, he wrecked me after the, or actually it was during the race. It was down to the crunch time in the, in the playoffs and we were racing for a championship and you know, that was the, the next to last race. So we were down to a lot of money on the line, a lot of business, you know, there. So, uh, that one was, that one stung a little bit. That one hit the old pocketbook. And when that happens, that's a whole nother level of pissed offness. Is that a word? Was that, is that what makes you the most pissed off? The funniest part about that story was, we were supposed to leave there. Things were good. We were flying to LA to uh, to Blake Shelton's house, and he was. Uh, who's, who's we? You and Jeff? No, me and Laura, my okay. my wife okay. Laura. Yep, awesome, awesome. We're Laura. we're flying Love to LA, you. and we're going to go to the Voice. It's her first time. She's a huge Adam Levine day. She wanted to meet him, right? So really, wasn't about any of us. It was about that. We get there. Blake wants nothing because he's a huge smart ass like I am. He doesn't care about anything other than what happened on, on the race. You know, let's let's <laughs> by the time we land in L.A., he is on a Twitter war with all of the universe, all Jeff Gordon fans. It's like little bitty old Clint's fan base and Jeff Gordon's fan base. It's been in a sport for 50 years. You know, it's like he is in a fight with all of them, including Ingrid, his wife. I'm like, what are you doing? No, stop. So that happened. We end up getting through that. And that was probably the most fun thing about it. It was that night afterwards is seeing how much satisfaction and enjoyment Blake got out of the fact that I got wrecked on that racetrack. <laughs> um, yeah. 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 It's good to have friends in high places. <laughs> It wasn't, that was a pretty low place for me right there. I can tell you that. But you were low, but Blake, you talk about your, you know, fan base and Jeff's and then Blake's. See, I don't see that. I see him being an Oklahoma boy. I don't see this LA guy that everybody else sees. I see the redneck from Oklahoma. But he kind of, but he lives in LA part of the time, right? Yeah, yeah, kind of. Sure. I don't like that Blake. LA Blake is, it's different Blake. LA Blake is, is is you know hair done and and weird clothes on i like camouflage blake that's a, that's the blake i like camo blake do you find that do you find the the clothes that you'd like to that you normally see blake in down at uh what's your favorite store that you go to every time you're home true blue blues something blue there, stamp. There? there you go how what did you did you read my profile how did you remember blue stem that is the best store ever ever <laughs> It can oh, fix anything but a broken heart in the moon. I'm telling you right now. If it can be fixed, it's going to happen at Blueston. <laughs> because there's everything from what to what there. It's got a wall of Wranglers 500 feet long. So you got clothes. It's got a boot <laughs> leg. It's got work gloves. It's got cattle chutes. It's got feed. It has hydraulic oil. Like bolt bend galore. Anything that you need to fix anything, Dan. I can see that, that picture on the wall. You hung it with blue stem parts and pieces. That that behind you was done at blue stem. That, I'm telling you the gamut. Whether it's Danikin, Scottsdale, Arizona, or dipshit Clint in Emporia, Kansas, I'm telling you it can be fixed at blue stem. It sounds like you could fix a broken heart there, though. If they sell beer and fishing rods and guns, seems like you could just sort of take that out there into the world and, and get better. It's a great point. Because my heart does feel better every time I go there. It just makes me feel better about myself. It doesn't matter how bad a day it can be fixed at Blue Stem. Go blow 
four or $500 of blue stem, the day is fixed. Where do you get all this humor from, Clint? I really want to know. Let's unpack your childhood. We're going to go, going to unpack my childhood? Yeah, <laughs> I feel like it's in there somewhere. I thought this was a podcast, not a psychiatry. You know, I, I don't know. It's both. You won't know the difference, though. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I don't know. I, I grew up as a, a middle child. Um, you know, and the biggest thing with our family is no different probably than yours. We raced nonstop. We didn't sometimes do anything else. You know, we tried to do the, you know, stick and ball stuff. My brother played some basketball. Um, we, I, I went to football, I guess at camp the first day is that camp before, you know, school starts with all my, my big corn fed buddies go into football camp. I'm thinking, man, I want my pads. I want my helmet. I mean, I, I'm ready to go. I'm going to be a football player. Right. Probably. You're not, a, you're not big enough to be an offensive lineman. Or... Danica, this is my story. You asked the question. I'm telling <laughs> you. So, so here I am thinking I'm, I'm going to have my own helmet, right? Can I have pads? I'm going to be the man. The coach, and I will never forget this. This is my football career in one day nutshell story. First thing we do, walk in the door and he goes, all right, boys, run to McDonald's and give me a, 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 a Big Mac and come back. I'm like, you mean the, the McDonald's in town? It was six miles into town. He made the football team run, run to get him a sandwich at McDonald's and back. Oh, Clint didn't have that in him. I was like, man, this ain't for me. It's no helmet, no pads, and running. Nah, 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 nah. I'm going to go back to uh, to race a motorcycle. So that was my football career. Um, tried basketball, still not tall enough, you know. So it was motorcycles for us. We actually, my dad owned a towing service, and Tony Reynolds, a guy that worked for him um, back in, you know, in the day, raced motorcycles. He had a practice track behind my father's shop in his towing business and we used to go back there i mean little little i remember watching tony ride you know his motorcycles back there i'm talking before pw50s so santa claus naturally after we were watching tony rides here comes you know santa claus brings us a pw50 which well, is a tiny little bike right it's like a little yes, small everybody's like introduction fit you know 50 motorcycle forever i mean my god it's things still exist and the part number is exactly the same from 1981 that's how good is a it product really BW50. oh my god okay. but there so, are people listening that are probably living somewhere like california or you know new york and they don't know what well they got to use electric ones now i don't even think they allow anything gasoline out there anymore you can't even have a, a gasoline <laughs> lawnmower in california anymore what uh, what kind of fun is that? Zero. I know. I hope they run out of battery. Use a generator to start it. <laughs> I'll, I'll loan them one. So anyway, here we go. We're going racing. We have a tractor tire, as does everybody, full of sand. That was our sand pit. We're, we're old enough now that we have motorcycles. There's no reason for a sand pit anymore. We built a ramp over the, the tractor tire. The rest is history, man. We were off motorcycle racing and and having a blast, doing it as a family, like I was saying, and traveling all over the place. The one thing that was instilled in us from an early age, and that you don't know it until you get older, is, is the work ethic that your parents mm -hmm. put forth for you to have this opportunity in your career. Yeah. And it happened for me, you know, once I had kids. I look back now that Cash is racing late uh, uh, go-karts, and I'm like, Dad, what in the hell were you thinking? I mean... We were racing 13 hours away in Lake Whitney, Texas on a Sunday afternoon, just an afternoon race, just a summer shootout race every single weekend, 13 hours away. We would wake up in grade school parking lot, walk straight into the, the school and go to school. He drove all night long, all by himself, did well, it dad, every dad, single dad, week. Your dad mm -hmm. drove then, right? He was yeah. driving. Every what single did, week. What did he live off of? Because I'll tell you what my dad lived off of because he did something similar too. What did he take take what did he eat or drink to stay alive for those? Drives? So my dad always ran, you know, he had a towing service. That's 24 hours, seven days a week. Doesn't matter if that phone rang. I honestly just think he conditioned himself to do that. Like he literally would drink some coffee every now and then, but nothing, usually nothing. Just wow. Well, my dad was just on pure crack. He was on Mountain Dew, Mountain Dew and Sweet Darts. <laughs> I'm telling you, like he, it was a beast when it came to that. Like, you know, when we grew up, we had, you know, as people had phones in your house. Remember those? Remember that oh, phone that would ring, right? Oh, I bet yours was long. Go hiding around the corner. How long oh, the cord yeah. did you have? 
Dude, I had so many. Hide from dad. Of course. Yeah. I had so many boyfriends. I'd have totally have, I have a long cord. Boyfriend called you're on a hundred foot cord out in the backyard in a shed from the living room. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so we saying we, uh, I love you. No, I love you. I love you more. I love you more. I love you the most. I love you to oh infinity. Those God. kind of conversations when you're like, you know, 12. Yeah, I didn't have those. We were racing. So anyway, we had a, a, a line in our in our house. It was line one was home and it had a different ring. Line two ring, you knew what that meant. As soon as you heard that in the middle of the night, you'd hear dad stomping down the hallway, going to tow some drunk out of the ditch at three o'clock in the morning and probably wasn't even going to get paid. Like he always did that. So that work ethic was was there from the beginning for us. And and honestly, that's what I think kind of what what made us who we are, you know, but but you asked me why I guess a sense of humor, just being on the road, having nothing else to do than to just mm-hmm. pick on one another. You know, when my old man and I are together, everybody's like, what the hell's going on? Do you guys hate each other? You're like, <laughs> what are you talking about? This is our love you, language. Like you, you guys are cussing each other and, and well, uh, but he hasn't left yet. You're like, that's <laughs> just kind of the way we, we, I don't know. That's how it works. <laughs> so we've, we've always had a lot of fun and, and it always, you know, usually was going up and down the roads, you know, racing and gosh, so many stories, you know, like, my older brother, let me tell you a funny story. Yes. I probably shouldn't even be here. So my brother was had his learner's permit, which I think in Kansas you could get at 14, right? So the old man was working a truck wreck the night before. Here we are headed back down to Texas. And we had a, a Winnebago now. We're big time, right? We had like a cheap time. Three, I think it was. Little, we had a van. Yeah, cheap in 33, Winnebago. Whoa. We were, I tell you how big a deal we were. We were in the back. This old girl had not one bed, you know, it had two like little single, double, whatever they are in the back, but we were playing Excite Bike. I will never forget this the day I died. Me and my buddy were playing Excite Bike. Remember that game? Pretty no. Sport. Nintendo Excite Bike? Are you kidding me? I played track and field and duck hunt. I didn't play Side Bike. Duck what Hunt's cool. That's the Excite Bike. Excite Bike. It sounds Dude, cool well, for, a ding, ding, ding. for a boy who loves bikes. So anyway, we're racing motorcycles, we're playing side bike. Going down the highway, dad falls asleep, lets Andy drive, 14 years old. <laughs> the Winnebago. <Cruise> set. <laughs> Andy's got the cruise set in the old Winnebago. Here we are. Next thing I know, like you're jumping jumps. And <laughs> it wasn't the motorcycle jumping anymore. It's the Winnebago jumping. We go barreling down through the median. Boom, boom, boom. boom. Back up on the top, the refrigerator flies open. A whole bowl of chili mom made for us flies out of the refrigerator, all over the floor, broke the glass pot. Dad's fine. It threw, I tell you how hard we hit it. Threw dad out of the passenger seat <laughs> onto the floor. He looks up, there's headlights coming. So he freaks out, grabs a hold of the wheel, and pulls the thing. So here we are, bounce through the ditch, and I mean jumping through the ditch. It gets <laughs> calm, right? It's like, all right, I. I think everything's fine. <laughs> Next thing I know, no, wasn't enough. We're on the wrong side of the road. Dad pulls the wheel back over the ditch. We go all the way through the whoops like we just went through hell and back. We get back on the right side of the road. And by this time, all of us are on the ground. The TV and everything's off. Excite bike's gone. We're like, what in the hell just happened? Me and my buddy go running up front. Dad is on his knees. He is on his knees driving the motor home. Andy is freaked out with his eyes this big. Finally get this thing stopped. My brother freaks out, takes barreling out right out the door, and we're running. Now we're like the clamp. It's out on the side of the highway. Andy's <laughs> running from my dad. Like clear over by the fence on the, on the highway. I'm like, what, what happened? So Andy fell asleep. We had the old Winnebago was ghost riding is what I'm trying to tell you. Oh, <laughs> So, so then we had like a family huddle, right? So what do we, what do, we do? do? Do we turn around? We're freaked out. They're scared. Everybody's scared, but everybody's okay. You know, we go back and check the, every, the load out in the trailer. Bikes are fine. Nothing's really crazy there. So dad's like, well, you boys want to go racing? Kept going, baby. Oh my God. That is That's spectacular. No you guys chili. ever have any wild stories on the road? I mean, there's no food left, but go racing. Why no not? No chili. And by no the way, that's a hell of a mess. Don't have to oh put a chili in a refrigerator in a motorhome just for that very reason. 
Yeah, that sounds like it'd be an absolute awful job that I'm sure you boys had to do. Do I have crazy have stories one? like that? No, like I don't. My sister and I just cuddled in the back of the truck. We at first dad had a truck with a little extender cab on the back and then we got a van. So the extender cab was either way too hot or way too cold. And Brooke and I would lay up there and sleep a lot. And then um, and then we got a van and uh, we called it the fun van because all the fun's inside. And uh, it had an electric back back bench that laid down to a bed it was electric pretty cool yeah. and there's a tv in the middle so we could watch movies and headsets on each side i mean it was wait super a minute good. so that's like a, a conversion van well it's a real van i mean it was one of those giant an electric things. couch that's like that's a high-end deal you, you, well it was no winnebago though well i mean this is true this, this is, is true. true so no we just cuddled and 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 you know dad dad's fiery so sometimes there was some crying going on after races but <laughs> Um, <clears throat> what kind of role did like, like each, you, you know, all the brothers, like what, what was, what's the personality of each? So, well, Andy was, I, my older brother was the one that by all rights, we all thought was the super, he was the superstar when we grew up, he was the baddest. I mean, we all know Ricky Carmichael, who that is. Andy beat Ricky Carmichael in a national event at Loretta's in an amateur national, like he was good, really good. You guys you know? were all good. I mean, you were a kick-ass dirt Andy bike. was extremely good, you know, and, and really stood out, and especially in the Midwest, and, and you know, I mean, was awesome. He got hurt. He got behind, and, and the, the difference between motocross racing and, and car racing is practice. You know, you can practice every single day on a motorcycle, and you That's get better, true. you know, and you really don't have – that element that you have in cars where a lot of times you're only as good as your competition or, or your equipment. Sorry. You yeah. know, you're only as good as your equipment you're sitting in. I mean, you can't, if that thing's not there, I mean, you know, we we've lived it, you know, if, if, yeah. if that, if that hot ride's capable of winning, you're going to have a chance of winning. If it's not, you're going to do all you can do to get the best finish you can. And a motorcycle, you really don't have those things. It's all just your natural ability and your talent. Um, you know, that carries you through. That being said, Andy got hurt and it really set him back. He couldn't ride. He couldn't practice for that, you know, six to eight weeks, whatever it was. In the meantime, all of his competition was every single day grinding it out. You're farther behind. Now you get back on that thing. What do you do when you're behind in a race car as a competitor? You overdrive. You, you, overdrive. you drive it harder. And next thing you know, you're on your butt again and you're hurt again. Now you're even farther behind. Then you're farther behind. and You just can't catch up. And, and honestly, that's what happened. He was, he was really, really good, had some injuries, got him behind and just never could catch, you know, up again. But at the end of the day, the industry was good to him. He, he wrote a lot of articles for Racer X, met a lot of good friends with the Fox family and heck he lived with John Fox for a long time, you know? So he had a lot of good years in him in the motocross world, loves that industry. We're all still connected to it pretty well. Um, but you know, that was, that was Andy's story. He lives in Florida. He got two little girls and, and things are fine. But again, we thought he was going to be, you know, the superstar. Dipshit Clint was working at a Goodyear tire store in Emporia, Kansas, because I didn't know anything else to do. My boss was building a, a Chevelle and I mean a boat Chevelle. Like a, I think it was a 76. I'm talking a boat. Um, it's way too long. We go the we went to the junkyard, got an engine out of the junkyard, by the way. What the yeah, hell did you do with that? Not like Bob's racing engines. I'm talking junkyard John's engine out of a, an old Malibu or something, put it in our Chevelle. We go to the racetrack. I'll tell you what you do with it. You blow up and it yeah. grenaded time and time again. We come back. We did that so many times. I remember coming back in on a Friday night and not even getting back to the shop. We'd go straight to Junkyard John's and get another engine, take our heads and our intake carburetor and put back on it. Our head headers, by the way, is a big deal back then. Put it, And we'd go back racing Saturday and did that time and time again. Next thing you know, I'm like, man, I want to drive this thing one time. Let me drive. And, and again, the rest is history. That's what really – kind of catapulted That's me. That's what made you want to drive cars instead of bikes? Oh, yeah, dude. I was going to those guys. I mean, what did you not like about this? There was there was a good race, which is, you know, we're competitors. There was a hell of a party and a lot of good-looking girls. 
I I'm knew in. you were going to say girls. And if you didn't, I was going to ask. I'm in, baby. This was exactly <laughs> what I was looking for my whole life. <laughs> Off to the races we went and I never looked back. <laughs> Unless she was cute. <laughs> then you look twice. <gasps> oh, my God. Let's talk about what racing's really like. What do you mean? I don't know. I think there's probably a perception of, you know, I don't know. I don't know. What do you think the perception is? I feel like, you know, you and you could sit here and give us some, you know, tell people what it's really like out there. What is it really like to be a race car driver? Talk about like car versus driver. And like, that's the age old question. Right. And I mean, I know my answer, but you know, what the heck's it really like to be a real race car driver? My wife actually asked me this question. Racing for a hobby is a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. racing for a living isn't fun at all. It's a business. Yeah. You know, when I raced in, in the cup series, very, very seldom was I truly having fun unless you're staying in victory lane. Now that's always fun. That's the goal, right? That's the, the day's end goal on Sundays is to be in victory lane. <laughs> but honestly, if you're not in victory lane, it's not fun. It is, it is very challenging. It's hard work. It's, what you've invested your whole life into and it's very serious and that's the way racing was for me you know i was very very seldom in a race car ever out there you know everybody thinks i'm just happy go lucky and and wild and crazy not behind the wheel i was always you know very very serious and and didn't didn't enjoy um the actual racing until it was over with and you could get mm -hmm. back with your friends and stuff like that that doesn't mean that i didn't always want to be at that racetrack and, right. and more importantly, be in that race car. That was where I guess my favorite place to be. But when I was competing for a living on that stage, it wasn't fun for me. It was dead serious. And, and I meant every minute, you know, every so minute I was there. If you wanted to be, if it, if you say that it, it's not that you didn't want to be there, um, but that wasn't necessarily your fun. Then what was the driving force? Other than um, winning. I mean, there has to be more than just competing, that. man. It's always about competition. You know, Take I love like, did you like passing? Did you like practicing and making the car better? Oh did my like God. Did you just ask if I like practicing? There is nobody in, alive in, in the human form that likes practicing. No possible chance. And now you like practicing. I just didn't like it when there was three day practices. Those were Brutal. Oh, it's terrible. Like God, practice day, six fun. laps and, and you know, oh, oh, it looked like it was a really big handful, man. Thanks for not crashing my car. Yeah. Thanks for trying to kill me. I'll bring it right back here. And Hey, by <laughs> the way, make another change. Let's go try it again. That was fun. Let's go do that again. <laughs> I like it. Over for three days. When like, they make really big changes and then they're like, Hey, we just want to try this concept. Oh, you yeah. know, like just yeah, concepts never, that's never a good terminology with an engineer. The Let's code, try this concept. The code feel it out was like, Hey, this might be a bag of shit, but just like, you know, try not to crash it, but we <laughs> want to try this. What? How do you feel something out in a race car? By the way, in our cars, the only way they make grip is to go the, the speed that they're designed to go. So if you're, if, if, if that thing's supposed to run 190 miles an hour and you're running 140, feeling it out, it doesn't have any grip. So you have to go out there, rifle that thing off in the corner wide ass open and go past the feeling out point. The only thing you're going to feel out is your ass when it hits the wall as hard as it does at 190 mile an hour. That's what you feel out. Then you get back there and look at them cross side and they're like, super sorry about that, man. I sure hope you, you're okay. You're like, yeah, I guess I will be next week. Yes, that didn't work. Yeah, no shit, Sherlock. <laughs> that, by the way, those happen. We've all had those. Oh, and yeah, yeah, yeah. Feel it out. Sometimes it oh. was, again, on the feeling out or, or a, you know, a science project or something like that. But on those, you always feel bad for that guy, too, because he's the one that made that call. And you'll come back in and, and you know, you see that guy and he's just like, it's like, you know, I'm so sorry, man. Are you okay? So I always kind of felt bad for those guys too. Yeah. I guess adding 10 pounds to the left rear didn't work. <laughs> well, it did um, till it didn't. Yeah. Um, so yeah, but like what, like more about it, like, I feel like people just, it's hard to know about racing. It's hard to know what it's really like. And, you know, maybe even just like, we could start with like, whether the car versus the driver. And yeah. you know, I always say that, you know, the drive, the car, the best driver can't win with a bad car, but an average driver can win with the best car. 
Oh yeah, absolutely. And, and that's, that's just spot on. You know, I mean, I think that's gospel as far as I'm concerned. I will say this, and I don't want to go away from thinking or, or push people to think that I didn't enjoy myself out there. Now, the one thing that I did enjoy more than anything was passing people. Mm-hmm. It takes a lot of, a lot of discipline, a lot mm-hmm. of focus, a lot of, you know, learning, studying somebody, watching them make a mistake, pushing them to make that mistake, right? Putting that pressure on somebody. There's nothing more fun in a race car when you're driving somebody, knowing that they're looking in the mirror and they keep driving it off in the corner harder and harder. You're like, don't do it. Don't do it. They drive it off in there. And next thing you know, they're sliding up the track and you got them. You know, that's the best feeling in the world being behind the wheel. And when you force somebody else to make a mistake because you were that much better than them that day, that's a cool feeling. So those days and and those circumstances in a race car were were things that I really did enjoy. But, um, you know, the difference in the drivers versus equipment, I think that's evolved too, Danica. I think when we first started or when I first started, you know, you had 900 horsepower. That thing would bite you. You My dad was trying to tell me, my dad was telling me that I was around in the 900 horsepower days, but I was like, I don't know. I thought it was more like 700, but my dad has better memory than me. When did it drop down? I mean, my first year was in cup was 2013. Really. I would say 12, 12. Dude, I think it was like 14 or something, 14 or 15. So, you know, Thank but you. I mean, you're not 200 horsepower out of cars. I mean, a lot of people that are listening to this podcast, that's how much their car makes. Total. Yeah. You know, they took that away. Yeah. So the difference in driving styles, you know, I, I really look at like a Tony Stewart or a Jimmy Johnson. They weren't quite as immortal you know, when those things happened, it came from no different than me, massive horsepower in a dirt car, a little bitty tire, Mm -hmm. you know, so you were always driving that thing with your foot, you know, and and not necessarily steering it with your foot all the way on the floor. Today's day and age, you're wide open, especially on a mile and a half track, you're literally wide open all the way around. And if you're hung out or loose or anything else, it's not because of the adjustment in your pedal. It's because you're, you're steering the thing and you've got it loose with your chassis and, and you're having to keep up with it with the input in, in your hands. That was something that really, really, you know, made me struggle with what I was trying to accomplish behind the wheel of a car. You know, when I couldn't no longer balance the car, so to speak, with my foot, with the throttle, um, it made you, you know, change everything that basically, you know, that was instilled from you from the beginning uh, and, and how I grew up. And I believe that Tony Stewart was the same way. And Jimmy Johnson, again, you put those guys back in them fire breathing dragons and 900, 950 horsepower that go right back to the top. I, I was sitting in my office and I looked over the reason I said that I was, I have ADD by the way. I think I do. I've never been diagnosed, but I, I'm pretty sure I do. Jimmy's picture from Eldora is on the wall right behind you. And I remember him getting in that car and everybody thinking, which I owned, we went to Eldora, he got in a dirt late model and everybody, including my brother, like, man, I don't know what you're thinking here. I don't know. Uh, he ain't never been in one of them. I said, watch, he'll be the guy to beat. Got out there. That picture right there is a him and me standing in victory lane. It wasn't me that wanted it. It was him. Oh, I, I knew it. Like it is just, that was that when I yeah. raced against him in the cup series, him hanging that thing out and using that throttle pedal to balance that car. It's what he's good at. Does that come from dirt racing though? Like, I feel like I'm more off, I drive off the steering wheel and not, I, yeah. not on the throttle. So is that more like pavement versus dirt? I definitely think it's a grip thing. You know, in dirt, you're never gripped up ever. Mm-hmm. You're always sliding around on top of the racetrack. So you're balancing, you know, that ball, you're balancing that thing um, with, with your throttle. You know, mm-hmm. a lot of times you're driving that automobile with, with the throttle and the brakes way more than you are the steering wheels. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I coming from go-karting and indie cars, like I definitely drove off the steering wheel more, mm-hmm. but yeah, I mean, racing's just, you know, it's one of those things. It's like, you know, it's, it's, you know, the biggest, stupidest thing I ever said, um, oh, stupidest thing I ever said was at the Indy 500 and it was qualifying. And it was the first year I wasn't like in the top 10 ish basically. And it was a struggle, like real struggle bus. Like I was shaking when I got out of the car because it was four laps on the knife sedge, which is not how you want to run at Indy flat out right. and qualify yeah. for four laps, which is two and a half miles each lap, which is 10. Um, and, uh, and I got out of the car and I said, I said, it's not my fault. 
I never lived that down, man. I heard that at, at Indy for years and years to come. <laughs> not my fault, not my fault. But, you know, at the end of the day, it's like, you know, the conversation we're having is that it's if the car is good, it's easy. That's the problem. Yeah. Way, way good. I mean, you're only as good as your equipment. And, and that is true. Like the best driver in the prime example is Kyle Larson. We both love him. I love him to death. I love what he accomplished this year. I, it was record breaking, literally record breaking. But a lot of my friends that don't necessarily know about racing took to him. I introduced him. Uh, some of my Nashville friends are like, dude, he's, he's killing it, man. Our friend Kyle, like, you know, all of them started calling me and like, Hey, my close personal, close personal friend, Kyle Larson. I'm like, you dipshit. No, what are you talking about? You know, but that's, they took to racing because of Kyle McGuys. He's been racing for five years in the cup series. Nah, 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 nah. This is his first year. I'm like, no, no, he's been around a long time. The difference is he's in different equipment. That proves the point, And it's been proven time and time again, but it's not a knock to people either. There's a lot of effort. There's a lot of, um, you know, there's just a lot of infrastructure differences through all the manufacturers. Oh, you know, yeah, because you have a Chevy As a rule changes, it plays right right into, Yeah, it plays right into the lap of, of said manufacturer, and that comes, you know, in cycles. We all know that, and especially in our sport. Yeah. Um, and But the brute honesty is it's all about people. It's always been about people and no different in any other business or any other thing in life. If you have the best people surrounding you, you're going to look the best. And that's just the way it is. You know, Kyle Larson has had the best team and the best organization, the best manufacturer this year around him. And, you know, all the ingredients were there and he put it together and was the man, you know, and, and that's why I was happy for him. I think it was a timing thing and he couldn't have timed it any better. He nailed it. Yeah. It's cool to see too, after all of his struggles and, you yeah. know, being out of the car and coming back. But what do you think? Like, I, I feel like I made it my probably my biggest mistake in racing was n not spending more time with team with guys with, you know, I just like, for me, it just, I look back and I'm like, it wasn't fun. I didn't like hanging out the shop. I didn't like, you know, I didn't, I, and also like either they were really old or really young and it's either, you know, you're not going to go out to dinner with some, like it's inappropriate or it's just like, I have nothing in common with you. And so, I don't know. I look at it like that's probably where my girl, the girl in me showed up a little bit. It was just not like, if it was a group of girls, I'm sure I would have made friends with them, but I, I, that was kind of my regret. And I feel like that not a regret, but that's something that I could have done better is get the team to work around me. So like, how do you create the environment? Because you can have super talented, talented people, but they're not inspired, right? You can have talented people that are not putting in the right effort. And so how do you, like, what do you think is a, is a common theme with the years or the teams and groups that you've had the most success with? Well, I mean, I think for you, it was different. I mean, it just was, you know, you were an attractive female racing. Like you're, you just said it. If you're out with a young engineer, you guys are dating automatic, you know, and the worst thing about racing is how tight a circle that is. And it like literally, oh my God, heavens forbid, if you even get caught talking to somebody like it's, it's on, it's done, it's official. You might as well put it in record books. They're they're full on dating and, and that's just the way it is. So I couldn't imagine of doing, you know, what you did all those years being, you know, the female that you were. And, and ultimately it was, you know, a pretty male dominant sport. Um, for me though, it was always about that. That was the most fun, you know, my most fun memories of before I got to NASCAR was driving all over the country with the boys in the truck you know, the dually and, and trailer and learning life and, and life lessons, miss screwing up, putting the wrong fuel in the truck and being broke down on the side of the road and trying to pump that out. Oh, oh shit. Don't tell dad, you know, or, or get off somewhere. And we about burn a motel down one time with a bunch of guys. We got drunk in the parking lot, started a guy's car and about got thrown out. I mean, like those are the memories that like, you know, you, you just can't replace. But once you get to this level and it's professional side of it, it was still that way for me. I had to have fun with my guys and everybody had to have fun. The best year I ever had was in 2012. Back to that, that incident with Jeff Gordon that you were talking about at the end of the year, we kicked ass. We were really fast. We were 
knocking on the door for a championship right down to the last race of the year and took care of business. But I'm telling you, nobody, and I mean nobody, ever had as much fun as we did doing it. Like, it was dangerous to go to the track because back then, not only were you doing it, you know, on, on you know, Friday through Sunday, we were testing all the time. We'd oh, leave Sunday and fly to – so, you know, everybody always says, why do you, why do you idiots have your own planes? I'll tell you why. Because when I started, if you asked wanted to be home at all ever during the week, you better have a plane or, or access to a plane because you would leave Sunday and fly straight to another track somewhere in the United States. You would practice or test there for two days. And a lot of times you may go to another track and test there before you go to the next week's race, wherever that was. Like we were all over the place that year and i'm telling you in and out of cities that we'd never been to before having fun and that was a really really good time so you know it's 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 different obviously you know you asked the question but those are the memories and, and things that, that i guess i was good at you know mm -hmm. i could make sure we may have a bad weekend but i can make damn sure the boys had a good time doing it mm, yeah that's amazing yeah for sure you are and you are you are a freaking good time. Like I have no doubt that like being on you have any team. idea how bad the headaches hurt anymore being that good time. Everybody yeah, well, expects you to, when everybody expects that out of you, it's dangerous as hell. I just want to go to bed anymore. And then what happens when you and Blake are together? I mean, what happens? Is there, have you ever had to have your stomach pumped? First of all, he's like 14 feet tall and he's, <laughs> it's not fair. Like it's not the same fuel tank. You can't put same rocket liver, buddy, same liver. You bullshit. I disagree with that. There's no way a human that big has the same liver as mine. And if it, his has to be enlarged, it's, I'm telling you right now, it has to be. No, enlarged. it's shriveled. It's, there's nothing left of it. Disagree. Disagree. <laughs> and, and if you ever hung out with him a day, you would, you would agree with me. It's, there's something different there. <laughs> Wait, Clint, are you drunk during this interview? No, I'm drinking water. <laughs> Just kidding. You may have put vodka in it, but. That would be more fun. I swear this is coffee. <laughs> um, no, we've had some good times. That makes total sense. I mean, my best year was probably 2009 in IndyCar. And my engineer, my two engineers, um, we didn't have we 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 didn't have like a cr car crew chief. We called them engineers in IndyCar, and so there was a head engineer and assistant engineer, and um, we just had a freaking blast. We laughed all the time. We we just had so much fun. We gave each other so much shit all the time, and uh, that was my best year. Um, and um, funny how and so, that worked. Yeah, it's true. It's it's been a hard it's a hard hard thing to execute. Like, how do you make sure that happens? You know, that's a that's not an easy thing. And I think that's probably why it's hard to make the magic happen, no matter what sport you're in. Speaking of sports from Kansas, how are those Chiefs doing? Whoa, rocky road. But that's chemistry. What you're talking about? Yeah. That's what that is. And it's hard to find. And once you have it, it's hard to keep because. Everybody else, as a comp you know, when you're in competition and everybody sees that and realizes that they need it, you know, they, that's what happens in racing. I see chemistry over there with Danica and her two engineers. Well, that guy's an assistant. If I can make that assistant uh, uh, the main guy, pep him up a little bit, I'm going to pick that away. I'm going to take away and, and knock them down a little bit. That happens in racing all the time. You know, it's very, very hard to keep that chemistry, keep that team, you know, under the same umbrella, because mm -hmm. next thing you know, somebody's pulled one piece of that puzzle out and it's just not the same. Yeah. Um, that's right. Chiefs, God almighty. I don't know. I went to Nashville. I don't know if you watched the Titans game. We got our teeth kicked in. I won a bet with Kid Rock and I got his suite over there. So like he was supposed to, he bet on you Austin. Bob? Bob. You mean Bob? Story. Bob. <laughs> Bob bets on he we were at his bar and he's like it was the it was the night before the Nashville race this year he mm. was going out there he's excited and you know we were having a good time he's like just saw Austin Dillon 10 grand Austin Dillon wins the race I'm like no chance Austin Dillon wins but by the way I'm not taking your money and as soon as I said that bullshit you, what do you mean you, you're not too scared to bet me I'm like no I I don't want to take your money. Like I, <laughs> it's not going to happen. It's just not in the cards. I love Austin Dillon. But it's just not in the cards right now. It's not going to happen. Have you seen Kyle Larson, how fast he is? I mean, like if he gets 
COVID doesn't exist. I, I can't come to the racetrack this week is the only way you're going to not be, you know, he's not going to win. <laughs> that being said, Bob, listen to me. He's not going to win. <laughs> Get your hand out right now. So I shook his hand and I said, tell you what, we'll either no cash, either I'll pay you the 10 if he does win, or you take it out of the bar bill here, or Chiefs are playing soon. I want this suite at, at uh, the Titan Stadium. Naturally, I got the, the suite, right? Roll into Bob's suite. Man, it's nice. Booze everywhere. Things are good. <laughs> Brought my whole friends, everybody. I mean, we're rocking and rolling. Chiefs well, gear. Uh, I mean, you come in. All your you, friends were there? Well, I mean, I don't know where you hide anymore. Like, you're in the mountains. You're in the desert. I'm, I'm not coming out there to the desert blistering my ass to drag Danica. Oh, fine, whatever. Keep moving. Story, story, story. I drank a lot. Listen, so we go to this this game, got our chief stuff on. You roll in as the opponent. I mean, you got to, right? You talk to shit. We're talking more trash to fans down below, and we're going to kick your ass, and yada, yada, yada. We're chiefs. Oh, I mean, loud and proud, baby. <laughs> It was the worst game in Chiefs history. We got our teeth kicked in from the word go. Oh, my God, it was bad. It was the only game I've been to all year. Now I'm scared to death. Now we're coming back. I was in Vegas two days before they just played the Raiders, and I was so scared to stay because I was like, I'm going to jinx them. I have to leave. I can't watch the game. I want to stay, but I'm not. Left, wanted to see that new badass stadium. Didn't see it. Flew all the way across the country home, watched them win. So right now, I don't know where the hell we're at. We're high, we're go. low, we're everywhere. You if Patrick decides to show up and throw a good pass, we're good. If he throws 17 interceptions again, we're going to lose. It's just that simple. Young, young hot gun, you know, they just throw the ball and lob it up the there. Is, usually it goes where, he, where you think it's going to go. Here this year, it's been like – you know, a left-handed pass, all those cute things he's always done. You're like, hell yeah, man, my boy, he knew what was up. He did that on purpose. Now you're like, man, I don't know. Maybe that was just a little luck or something. Does he have baby brain? No. No, actually, I think his uh, – I'm just kidding. He's a no, freaking – I know, but I think his knowledge of, of what's going on in his surroundings, his situational awareness is just insane. You know, I think he sees things that other other guys don't see or sees it before them. Mm-hmm. And that's where he's always ahead. But man, you know, I think you're only as good again. It always goes back to the people. We've talked about this. You know, I, I don't know that his entourage is as good as it was. You know, we've lost a couple of weapons, a couple of receivers and oh, you know, yeah. some, some protection on the front line. Like you, you start taking that one piece, that engineer, that assistant engineer left Annika, that chemistry wasn't there anymore. You know, it's so important to, if you do lose it, you got to figure out how to make it back the way it was. Yeah. What's that? What do you think that is? Well, right now it's some uh, pass protection and uh, maybe a couple <laughs> of receiver. <laughs> that is the that is the hard thing. How do you? And I think that's kind of like the mark of an incredible, um, you know, athlete all around is when you can kind of start keep recreating magic um, because it's really hard. Other than you know, stumbling into the right situation, whether you're a driver or a football player or a baseball player, it's, uh, <clears throat> you know, it's all, well, I, have to fall into I right. guess, and I hate to give it to him because he's such a badass, and everybody knows it. But the biggest thing about this guy that I'm going to say, and I'm going to say his name, Tom Brady, mm-hmm. the biggest attraction to him is the fact that he did it. He, he pulled out of all that chemistry, all that stuff that everybody said that, man, it was it's what made him who he was. Belichick, you know, all the stuff, right? Pulls out of there, goes into a complete new environment. That's a ballsy move. In a cold year. You didn't he have to. He did spring training that year. He literally didn't have to do that. You know, no, he was going to go off into the sunset in the record books, probably never being, be touched again. He goes – challenges himself to try something new, knocks out of the park and wins another damn Super Bowl. Like how and and Gronkowski a- just re- raking it in, you know? But I mean, it's again, <laughs> he, he took a chance and made something else, yeah. you know, built a whole new chemistry and, and he did it himself, you know? So I love that, that the fact that he did that, I think at, at his point in his career, most, most competitors in any profession would, would not do that. 
wouldn't take that gamble because at the end of the day, your legacy is kind of on the line, you know, and, and I, was he still the, the baddest quarterback of all times? Yes. But if he went somewhere else and failed for two or three years, it almost kind of murkies that and diminishes that for a while until mm-hmm. time will catch back up. He didn't. He went down there and took care of business. And I wish he'd go off into the sunset already because I'm ready for somebody else. That's the biggest thing about Tom Brady. It's not Tom Brady. It's his damn fans. Those, oh, there's nothing worse than a Patriot fan. God, they're they're just very cocky. I grew up in the Midwest, so we also had a, we had our choice of who we thought the worst fans were living in Illinois. But anyway, um, uh, it reminds me of almost like Schumacher. Did you watch the Schumacher documentary? You know, my son Cash and I did, and it was probably the only time, well, I've let Cash watch a documentary, but it's the only time he didn't, you know, deter off of it. He stayed right there and watched every movie. I had a lot of questions. Well, wait a minute, rewind that, rewind. You know, like for a six-year-old to do that, it was pretty intense. And and what a what a story, what a career, what a level of intensity that was – unmatched really well i mean he recreated at ferrari you know you go to a team that had was terrible and he turned it around just by sheer will and being around and present and getting people i would say it's like getting people to work out of fear instead of uh, getting people to work out of love instead of fear it's like you can get people to do a really good job out of fear they're afraid they're going to lose their job but the difference between that and love is the next level and when you don't want to let your it's like if you're it's like a dad working on your son's go-kart you know like you don't want to let your son down but now if you're just a paid employee like who cares, you know, cut a right. couple corners, whatever, exactly. you know, it's, you're just, it's just, you know, it's not the same thing. And so when you can get people to work out of love, like their family, then, and they really care about you and they don't want to let you down to me, that's, that's what it is. And so when you talk about like having that chemistry with people and getting along, it's, it's like, this applies to any job, any sport, any job, when you are all like in such care for each other and you have fun it means you don't want to let each other down because you know you're 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 more than just co-workers you're more than even friends you're like family oh absolutely and that takes me back to 2012 with that year that we had i mean that's the way we we had each other's back you know if if i wrecked they'd pick me up or if you know if i made a mistake in the car they picked me up If it was a bad pit stop i mean you literally you felt bad for the guy because he felt so bad but you said it back to him. It's also confidence. That's a level of confidence, even in a professional sports, that is very seldomly seen. Like that level of confidence is is I didn't I wouldn't have done that. You know, I had a I'm a confident person and I was a pretty confident, yeah. you know, I was confident in what I did behind the wheel and in a race car, but if I won four or five championships and I had to start over from scratch again. At that point in my career, I, I wouldn't have done that. I'd have just been like, man, I've made enough money, and and why why chance it? You know, those guys, they did they challenged themselves. He's they wanted. It he He's literally it, like, said it in that he wanted to, like he wanted yeah. that challenge, and he wanted yeah. it on his shoulder. He wanted that that weight on him. No way. Who's got it? You think any? You think any other? Who? What drivers might have it in NASCAR at this point? Um, nobody. <laughs> <laughs> But I think that here's what is happening in NASCAR that I really love. Uh, I just watched Brad Keselowski's uh, press conference, Mm. you know, as an owner in a sport. I love that he's doing that. That's so good. Absolutely. It's good good for him. I love that he is a highly intelligent guy. Brad's got a lot of shit going on. Brad's a big deal. His Cam Industries thing, I went over and did an interview with him this year. And I'm telling you right now, Danica, he's probably going to be the most, the wealthiest race car driver that ever came through. And it won't be because, of course, it's because of his car. He couldn't afford her to do what he's doing. But I'm telling you what they're, they're building rockets, sweetheart. I'm talking building parts that are going to space. Oh, that's a different level. You mean literally? Yes. Oh, I want to go. Do you want to go? If if you could go to space, would you go? If they said you could go to the moon or Mars, would you go? Why would you do that? Well, because I want to see it. What do you, you, but you're, you like to see weird shit. Like, I don't. I don't like to see. Are you going to see it there? You're going to see everybody down there having fun. That's all you're going to see. Maybe you're going to want to be down there. Which one is it? 
You know me. I'm just a super. No way. Oh, you like the stars and the planets and all that. You want to spin them all. That's what you want to do. No, I want to come back in the next life as a cosmologist. Dude, I like I like my feet on the ground. That's what I like. <laughs> I get scared. That's way too high up there. <laughs> but um, no, let me let me finish on, cool. on Brad and, and what's kind of changing of the guard. You know, there's a lot of owners that are getting up there in age. There's a lot of concern, a lot of talk, a lot of what ifs. So like, what's going to happen? You know what? Yeah. All of them. All the big ones. You know, Joe Gibbs is is getting up there. Uh, Rick. Roger Penske. Rick Hendrick. You're starting to see a changing of the guard. Jeff Gordon. He quit me. I didn't make it. What I make it? Four months with him, and he already quit out of the TV booth, and he's went. Wait, back he's to, done. Dude, he sucks. What a wuss. Oh he went back. That's right. That's right. And then I texted you, and I'm like, "What are you going to do without Jeff?" I don't know. We had a lot of fun. I'm kind of you bummed. Want out me to come now. help you? You can. I I need help. Yes, Lord knows I need help. I'm gonna go do F1. <laughs> oh, oh, why bother with us, little peons? I'm gonna go do F1. <laughs> so. There is a changing of the guard. Jeff's going to, you know, going to help out and, and probably assume the role of, of, you know, running Hendrick Motorsports um, someday. You've got Brad now taking the role at, at Roush, Jack Roush, that we just, you know, one of the ones that are, that are getting up there. Denny Hamlin starting his own team. You know, I think this is a, a timing thing, and it's really an interesting thing that these guys, because that's a gamble. It takes a lot of confidence. That's a lot of risk right there, getting out past your skis. Like there is a lot on the line to taking that chance. And I, and I applaud those guys for doing that because I think the rewards there in the end, I think the sport is, is going in the right direction. I think the RTA and what they have going on is in the right direction for our sport. Um, it's RTA for someone who wouldn't know. Well, it's basically a union, an owner's union, like you have in football or any other, you know, sporting event. NASCAR didn't have that. It was the good old boys. The good old boys and their drivers, and we come to town and put on a show. There's the purse. You take your little calf. We'll take our cut, and they yeah, take a little bit, and we all go on to the next one. Did you forget what happened when, um, in the open wheel side of things, championship auto racing teams, when it was cart and all of them, everybody had to say so, and, you know, everybody was on, you know, all together, yeah. and then I, they all just went, and the whole That's thing it. dissolved. Those things have wings. Those are space know. shuttles. Again. I don't that, agree. Those aren't race cars. They have, there's those space shuttles. We, we, we have yeah, but it's cars. about the the business of it. No, and I, I think it's dangerous when you get too many people involved that um, that are powerful and and because they want their perspective and their opinion to be heard and executed. And when you get too many head honchos in a room shit's going down or, or not at all. You know, when, when it's, when, when people aren't heard and you can't hear all of them, so it's dangerous, but you know, well, there's certainly in, in sports, there's, there's the product, right? The, the product. And then there's the competitors who puts on the show, you know, in football, it's the teams. Well, those teams are worth something, you know, mm -hmm. and, and the way it was in our sport, those people that put on the show for the product, you know, they, they didn't, it wasn't the, the promoter, the promoter showed up. We'll, we'll simplify this the way it was back in, you know, Friday night lights under the lights at Lakeside Speedway, that promoter would, he'd give you the track, you know, and you would have to come on and put the show on for him for doing so you got paid, you mm -hmm. know, your, your payout, right. You got paid in victory lane. You got the payout back on back. That's how you made your end work. In our sport, the owners, they're that product. They have to put it on the on the table. So, you know, the sponsorship side of it, because they're on the track, because they're in front of 100,000 people, they're on TV in front of millions of people, that, that product is worth something. So they're able to sell that. The point is football has the same thing. Eventually, you got to figure out some structure to be able to have a viable business. You yeah. know, and, and, and when it goes to sell, say these guys are getting older, what are you selling before? Yeah. If they didn't form some sort of a union like that, you're really selling bricks and mortar and whatever your trucks and trailers and your jack stands are worth. That's about what you got. You've got millions of dollars worth of, a, of an entity. But if I'm coming to sell it to somebody, like what the hell are you selling? Right. Yeah. yeah, that's there's your hot rod. It'd be out there on Sunday. Here's your sponsorship. This is the way it works. But. 
I don't know. You have to go talk to them and see if they might buy into what you guys have. They, they, I don't know. I did a lot of business with them and maybe you can make it work too. So again, you got to have a viable business that you can, with a business plan that you can hand somebody that's worth something that makes and props up our sport to where the whole sport is in a better. Well explained Clint. Yeah. But I mean, that's, that's the truth. You know, yeah. and I think that that it is in a good way. And, and it goes back to what I'm saying about the opportunity and the timing standpoint of these drivers getting to the backside of their careers, having an opportunity to fill that in. Because, by the way, you need some youth, you need some some new eyes and, and some new vision, some new enthusiasm to be able to prop this thing up into the next decade. What do you, what do you think could make it better? I know that like, you know, one of the things that we've chit chatted about is just, you know, especially when you and Jeff were, you know, doing it last year, it's like, what could be better? Like, what could we do to make the drivers more attractive and people follow them? Like what, what you quit, Danica, way to go. But I quit. Yeah. You said, what can we do to be more attractive? You, you, you quit us. So (laughs) oh, thanks. The Uh, day We got paid to wear helmets, man. Yeah, so did I. But my answer to that is, what can you do? I think we're doing it. I think that I was excited to go to new venues. When this thing was really going like this in the 90s, yes, Dale Earnhardt was the baddest guy ever, right? Everybody wanted to be Dale Earnhardt. Rusty Wallace, Mark Martin, toughest oh, yeah. little race car driver in the world. Like, those guys were genuinely badasses. And they really – Dale Jarrett – they took this sport in the nineties to the next level because of I, and the other thing is you can relate to them, the relatability, mm-hmm. anybody, any blue collar working class human being could look at that guy and go, that's my guy. Mm-hmm. He could be right here in the body shop, bending on his fender, painting and spraying the thing. Like he could just as easily be doing that with me as being in that race car for me on Sunday. Like that connection, that relatability was so important. We've lost that a little bit. But the other thing that we they did in the 90s that we're starting to do again and where I'm going with this is going to new venues, being in front of a new audience, showing your audience that you already have something new where it's not so repetitious of the same thing over and over, lap after lap after lap, year after year, where boys are coming back to town. You can only sell that so long before it gets stale. It's true. You have to reinvent yourself. And, and sometimes – Venues do go stale. Things evolve. People evolve. Like, look at the difference a phone has made in somebody's life. Like, you can't get anybody to do anything anymore. Like, you go to dinner with somebody, and I challenge you to go through an hour and a half to two-hour dinner and not touch your phone. Watch. I mean, I've been texting the whole time since we've been doing this interview. (laughs) It's probably everybody saying, stop. (laughs) Shut that idiot up. No way. You're but right. I feel like, you know, for our sport to, to get back to where we were and, and trend, you know, the way they were in the 90s, um, we need to do that. And we are doing that. The L.A. Coliseum. What an awesome kick ass opportunity. The excitement's through the roof. I'm going to be able to call it. Um, we're going to a running track. Literally in a Coliseum. These cars have never done that. It's going to, all hell's going to break loose. It's going to be completely chaotic. Who's going to win? I'm telling you right now, anybody's game. Anybody's game can win that race because whoever's leading on the last lap, they're not going to win. No No (laughs) chance in hell they're going to win. And it's not going to happen. They're going to get wrecked. They're going to get out. They're going to be pissed off. Everybody's going to erupt. It's going to go crazy. It'll be controversy in the track. They'll talk about it for months. That's the kind of stuff that takes you to the next level. And I will say this. And I'll give it to credit. Ben Kennedy is the one. He's the family, you know, at NASCAR to like, he's the next one talking about changing of the guards. This kid is family, France family, and he's taking it to the next level. He's taking chances that, that, you know, maybe others that were running the sport couldn't do, you know, he's taking those chances and taking the lead. And, and it's a gutsy call going back to the conversations we've had about certain you know, competitors. I mean, that's a gutsy thing to do is pull out of something that is a, you're steady, right? To go and do that venue, to go take that chance and go somewhere else. That means you got to take something from somebody. Old yeah. place has been good to us, but we're going to take that race and we're going to go try something new. That's a gutsy call and it's going to be 
something that I feel like in 20 years going to look back on and really, really appreciate and say that was a difference maker. Yeah. Wow. Damn. You're a wealth of knowledge, Clint. What tracks need to go? Like maybe the second Pocono and the second. (laughs) None of them. I agree with you. And that's a funny thing. None of them need to go. Some of them need to be put away for a minute. Oh, put away, put put away. You know, and I know that that's a, that's a scary thing to say, but you know, I do believe you got to move it around. You got to shake things up. If, if things aren't working at a, a, you know, a second race or wherever, you know, so be it. But what makes things work isn't always that product on the racetrack. How many football games? Again, went to the Titans game. I say Titans game because they kicked our ass. Chiefs versus Titans. I was a Chiefs fan. Literally, Chiefs socks, underwear, pants, shirt, hoodie, hat. I'm a Chiefs fan. TMI. It was good. Very clear that I was for the Chiefs. We sucked, but I had a good time doing it. Yeah. There was a hell of a party going on. There was atmosphere. There was things alive. Didn't matter how shitty the game was. That's the point in that. You have to have environment. Those tracks have to do a good job of working in the in market, you know, with, with the people. You, when you come to town, I don't care where it is. You got to be the number one thing to do in that town. And yeah. if you're not – that's maybe when it's time to put it on the back burner or try something else, go do something else to where you are the number one show in town, whether it's a 20 year old kid or a 60 year old man, you're going to that come hell or high water. You're going to buy a ticket and you're going to sit your ass in the stands or wherever it is. You're going to see that go down because that's the end thing to do for that given weekend. You got to go back to that mentality. And we were there for a long, long time. There's a lot of venues that we still do and just kick ass in and, you see people having fun and I'm out driving around in a golf cart. I'm loving it. And I'm like, that is fun. If I wasn't out here in this car or up there in that booth talking about these idiots going around in circles, I would be out there being an idiot in my Winnebago cheap in 33 with bush lice drinking beer with my buddies. Like that looks like fun. That That's not a chili. Cause you can't always prove my point is you can't always count on that product providing that entertainment. Right. that's next level. That's competition. Sometimes it's there. Sometimes it's not. It won't all a rivalry game or or a rivalry race. That's not always going to be what everybody expects it to be. Yeah. How funny. That's, that's how I always, you got to have atmosphere, man. You got to have things going on because that's what props it all up and makes it happen. Yeah. I actually looked at myself like that. I looked at myself like I'm not always going to have a good day. But what else can I offer a sponsor? What else can I offer my fans? You know, there, there, there's got to be more to it. And I always felt like, you know, at least from a sponsorship perspective, like they were, they were winning no matter what, you know, they were, they were getting a, getting a really great product no matter what. And then when I did well, it was like icing on the cake, you know, if it's a great game, if it's a great race, whatever it may be, it's just icing on the cake. It should always be, it should always be fun though. So do you have so many good days in your life of Danica world that you, you have to punish yourself, like run cross state lines to, to, to make yourself have a bad day. Is that, is that why you run and and work out? And because you just, you have so many good days, you want to have a bad one Just make sure your (laughs) things are balanced out. Why would one do that? You know, Clint, some people like practicing in racing and some people like working out, you know, nobody I- likes practicing. Nobody <laughs> ever in the history of practice. There's no one. If you're telling me you enjoyed practice, we have no, no more in common, no chance in hell. Wow. Just when I thought, just when I was going to invite you to a big party, I was going to have, you know, I thought I have more in common than I thought. Maybe I should. <laughs> uh, you should be the you should be like the entertainment director for NASCAR. They should be like Clint. What should we do that would help people have more fun at the racetrack? I mean, would you not have the answer? You well, definitely I mean, I, I've got a lot of lot of opinions, and and honestly, we've had a lot of conversation with that. But I am a believer in the fact that you got to have that atmosphere to help prop yeah. it up on your bad days. Yeah, you know, yeah. they can't always be good days. And, and when they're not, if you do a good enough job of building and, and creating that fun atmosphere, that won't always be that way. I'm a big thing. I've always said this about any anything, any venue you go to. If you're going to charge admission and charge money for a ticket, I call them wow factors. And I feel like there has to be 
for you to go to an event, whatever it is, football, a, a, a competition, for it to be classified as something that you come back and tell your dad or or your your girlfriend jogging or whatever the case may be, you're going to take something from that venue, bring it back, and you're going to tell that story. God almighty, you should have seen this. You should have seen that. I call them wow factors. Mm. And in my opinion, a race has to have five. If you don't have five wow factors within a race, whether it's it's a, a gutsy call, whether it could be something as small as that, whether it was a, a wild wreck, unfortunately, as long as nobody got hurt, whether it was a crazy finish or or a fight, who knows? But I feel like you have to have five. You have to check five of those wow factors off for that to be a success, for that event to be something that – Bob goes back to the coffee shop on Monday and tells his buddies, you cannot miss this again next year. It was holy shit, crazy fun. Those five wow factors. Some of those are out of your control though. Could you apply those to like, wow, one of the wow factors could be a concert before the race. It could be. Ah, you brought, that's my point. Cause you can't bank on it being a good race. You might be at a, you know, you might be at, beautiful Kansas motor speedway where aerodynamics is really important yes. and they can't be close enough to each other to really mess with each other. So it's not that exciting. Yes. That's so what I'm saying. Opportunity. Bob goes back drinking. to the coffee shop. Didn't see it on the racetrack this weekend. Maybe last weekend he did, but this weekend he saw Danica next door and she was in a chieftain Winnebago motor home having beers with her friends. Holy shit. You got to be there next year. Like again, it doesn't always have to be that product on the racetrack. Yeah. But it better be more often than not. Yeah. I feel like there's like, this is cool. You know, I feel like, you, you know, you retired and you, you went into commentating. And what I hear from you now is like commentating is sort of probably pretty easy. And it's a lot of work in a different way, but it's pretty natural probably. And but this is like a conundrum to figure out. This is like a mission. And I don't know. I just feel like a fire within you around this. Like this is perhaps your next your next job essentially is how do we, how do we bring this sport back to a place that, you know, was, was reminiscent of um, another phase of its prime. Cause it kind of happens cyclically. Well, it's just, and I, and I feel like it's there, right? I, I don't, anything I, the biggest thing I hate about anywhere is watching someplace have the mentality of, well, we got to take seats out. Let's take some seats out and make that more a premium ticket. Yeah. <laughs> Bullshit. Let's work on, give me an, if like, if I was the CEO and you came in as the CMO and told me that, all right, I got it, boss. We're going to take seats out and we're going to make that back, you know, a list deal. It'll be way better that way. Like you're fired. No, <laughs> I need somebody to tell me how to fill those seats that I already have that I've invested in that are there. That's my mentality. Like there's no chance that's defeat. You know, as a competitor in you, like, no way. Build your product better. Make them come. Like, it has to be the number one thing to do in that town. You know, like, yeah. there's so many different things anywhere in, in the country that, that I feel like it could go. But it always, again, don't make no mistake about what I'm saying. I'm not saying it's not about the product at all. It is. That product has to be good. But you can't always count on it being perfect. Mm -hmm. I think in our sport – probably more than any other sport, you can manipulate that product more than you can in other sports. You know, if you think about a football game, you really can't change the football. You're going to be screwed. If, if you go to the NFL and an NFL fan tell old Bob at the coffee shop that we're no longer going to play with a football, we're going to play with a, something else, your product's pretty much screwed. With our sport, you can change something within the car, some aerodynamic things, a tire underneath of it, something as simple as a tire, and drastically affect what a fan sees on that racetrack. That is something that is way good about our sport versus a, some competitive, you know, competition as far as TV and ratings and things like that go. As a fan's perspective, is that how easily you can change you know, what, what you see as a product on that racetrack. That's something that I love about our sport over any other sport. Mm. All right. Well, what else do you do for fun? You're retired. What else do you do for fun, Clint? I've been building fence, Danica. I was building, I froze my ass off. No one builds fence for fun, Clint. No one. Okay. 
So I told my buddy, he calls me, this is a good line. And I was like, I got to remember that. He goes, uh, what are you doing today? I was like, man, I'm building this fence. I changed the fence around. My longhorns are having trouble. So I, I built me a little fence around there and it's a pain in the ass. It was freezing cold. I've got blisters on my hands. I've like 75,000 times yesterday. You're asking yourself, what in the hell are you doing with your life? This is what you're doing. You're out here building fence. 42 years old, you're building a fence in the middle of nowhere for some damn longhorn. You're probably going to go through it, destroy it anyway. That's what you're doing. So he calls and asks me, Eric, and he says, hey, what are you doing? I said, building a fence. He goes, don't you have one of those tools? I'm like, no. He goes, yeah, I got a really nice tool at the house. It's called a phone. Call somebody that knows how to build a fence. I said, yeah. yeah. I mean, did you not think to yourself for just a second, I'm rich. I could just hire someone to do this. I've been building fence, Danica. That's what I've been doing. But it's kind of my escape away from – it's my protection. Yeah. If I'm not at my ranch building a fence, I'm out the week before I was in Key West. You're not it drinking. Very you're it wasn't a very productive week is what I'm trying to say. If I you're was, not building a fence, you're drinking, and it's really just it's helping yourself. <laughs> yes, safe. yes. And now you get this age. Now I hate running. Like nobody's chasing me anymore, so there's no really reason to run. You're out here putting pounds on as you speak. Like, <laughs> like I can drink this and put seven pounds on all of a sudden. It's like, what in the hell was that? What happened? Maybe that's the problem. I feel like I gained some weight after NASCAR and I'm like, something's happening. I mean, now mind you, I have plenty of medical shit that I'm dealing with that I, that I could be the reason, but I'm like, maybe it's because I'm not running marathons every weekend, essentially, which is, you it's know. Not, it can't be that. There's got to be a better answer, Danica. If I have to run marathons to keep from being overweight i guess i'm just gonna learn how to be happy overweight like i'm you're just instead of two chins instead of two chins i'm gonna have four like that's just why do you think i wore a turtleneck (laughs) i think you're confused like like, i don't know what's going on your 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 turtleneck (laughs) screams it's cold outside and then your your sleeves off scream that you're in arizona and you're blistering your ass it's hot like i'm a i'm a i'm a big ball of duality you know (laughs) all ends of the spectrum well, Clint, I'm really, I think this next chapter of your life becoming, uh, you know, involved with the sport and helping the sports to be really cool, really helpful. And I just hope you remember the little people when you are like CEO of NASCAR. By the way, you picked at me for drinking when on my time off. You literally have your own booze. Do you understand? <laughs> I that? Do. Yeah, two, two of your own businesses that <laughs> evolve drinking. So do not pick on dipshit. Oh, yeah. Oh yeah. By the way, readily available right there. <laughs> I did a, um, wait, it's right here. Cause I did this the other night. It was like a caviar wine tasting with my, so it's like this fancy caviar lady. She, she did caviar for Paris Hilton's wedding the night before. And then she did my little thing the next day. And then we, I had wine delivered. So these are all my wines. Yeah. They look really good by the way. Thanks. Do you think you'd even like offer me a sale, maybe 3% off something. I should. I a should. Good buddy deal. I should, but you're gonna have to come to Arizona to get it. I'm in. I'm in. If that means bring your like, wife, please. Yes, but well, she'll drink I, all my booze. She'll drink all the wine. Well, you call it booze your wine, or what do you call it? With caviar, do you, is it booze? Because no, in Kansas, I call it wine. You by know? the way, by the time they offered caviar in Kansas, that's why I, I don't like caviar. By the time it was offered in Kansas, you probably shouldn't try it. A little bit rank. Wait, one more thing. This is just something to say. You don't have to reply. Did we even start this thing? Do you remember? Like, I don't think we started. No, we'll do this tomorrow. Um, the, the next time you go out hunting, uh-huh. I mean, no, this is a little hypocritical because I do eat meat. I just don't like to kill it. And I feel bad when little baby Bambi dies. So if you just don't mind drinking too much so that when you like aim at the target or bow and arrow or whatever you do with it, you miss. Bow and arrow at the target. You just just miss, just miss just one miss. for me, okay? Or a whole this, all of them. This shit on my face that is it's for a good reason. It's so I can blend in to the bush. That way I can. Oh, no, you out find there. that down at your store, two two step or whatever. Like blue stem, damn it! If you would get me off this thing, however I turn this off in a minute, <laughs> I'll be back out there and I'm going hunting as soon as I get off of this. So I appreciate your time. This Thanks, was pretty Clint. intense, by the way. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, how about that for a plug? Thanks, Clint. 
Thanks everybody for listening to the Pretty Intense podcast today. I hope you enjoyed it. If you like what you heard today and you want to hear more, please click on the subscribe button.